Hey, Ephraim, how are you, man? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on, Jeff. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's uh, October 18, 7 p.m. Welcome to the <clears throat> Next Level Conversation. Um, I'm really excited to have you here tonight. We've spoken a bit before, but now that we're doing the interview, I'm really psyched that you're here. I wanted to say a couple of words about you before we got into our conversation. Um, you're a former Navy SEAL. You were served in the United States military uh, six and a half years in Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, I would say liberating that area, fighting for the U.S. I'm not sure if you recognize if you were liberating the people or what your cause was going to be when you got over there beyond fighting for the U.S. But after that time, you came back to the United States and then immediately decided to go back as humanitarian warrior to work alongside with Iraqi soldiers to help the oppressed against the ISIS terror groups. Is that correct assumption? Yeah, 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 that's 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 accurate. Just one thing has to be clarified. I didn't actually serve, and that's very interesting, I didn't actually serve in Iraq at all during my time. So my first time in Iraq was actually when I got out of the military and went there. I, I'd fought in Afghanistan and then deployed out um, all around uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so yeah, it was kind of ironic. My first time in Iraq was as a civilian, even though I had my background as a as a as a navy seal right and why why afghanistan that why deployed there and not iraq was that after the first skirmish had had occurred and then you went into afghanistan that's actually the the time that i the the i so i, I deployed to afghanistan in 2014 it was actually a very interesting uh, historical moment um at the time so we put uh, american troops pulled out of um iraq in 2011 um, I didn't uh, join them. I, I joined the military basically that same year, uh, early 2010. And so when I actually made it to a SEAL team and was on my first deployment in 2014, after you know two and a half years of training or three and a half years of uh, training and selection and uh, being sent out there on my first mission, um, in 2014 we had no troops in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And so when I was I was I was fighting in Afghanistan, and and when we were in Afghanistan, we were actually. Uh, some of the last naval special warfare guys to be out there. There's still some, uh, you know, Green Berets that are out there doing good work. Um, but we were, I was with one of the last platoons of, of SEALs that was uh, being assigned to the area. We were uh, down, or I guess downgrading the amount of troops that we had in the region. But what was interesting about it was toward the end of our deployment, um, this, we started hearing about this, uh, this new terror organization in Iraq called ISIS. And we were like, what's ISIS? Like, we never heard of that. And so we're out there fighting the Taliban, coming back to our uh, coming back to our compound, and then getting these reports and like, hey, like they just sent in a SEAL platoon into Iraq, and they're dropping bombs on these guys called ISIS, and we had you know um, no idea who they were. And then uh, toward the end of the deployment, we started actually losing our air support. So uh, we would say, hey, man, we need a we need an AC-130 gunship, we need some A-10s, you know, we need we need a bunch of aircraft. And they say, hey, sorry, we don't have it. They're all in Iraq now. Or, you know, the, mm. the, the two planes that we have here are being used on other missions. And so it was really interesting. We're like, oh, we, we started realizing, oh, man, like ISIS, that's like a that's a that's a that's a real deal. I mean, if they're pulling our AC-130 gunships for, you know, from our missions, which are, you know, getting pretty kinetic, we're getting into pretty gnarly gunfights and they're sending them to Iraq. Man, things had to have uh, had to have gone bad. And right. um, so yes, that was our, our first understanding of ISIS. So, so before you got over there and many other soldiers, people, uh, soldiers or your intelligence were not aware of this group or the strength of this group or what their abilities and capabilities were and how they would eventually disrupt what was going on over there. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I'm sure there were some intelligence assets who knew uh, on the ground what was going on in Iraq and this mm -hmm. whole new thing of, of ISIS that was happening. But as far as I, as far as I knew, and as far as anybody else in my platoon knew, we never, we never heard of them, right? Um, because they, yeah, they were new and they were going yeah. crazy in 2014. I wanted to add what I didn't add to the front side of our of our discussion was that, um, you know, there was a video that went viral of you when you were doing some humanitarian work when you got shot, and there was also a uh, a book written about you, or you co-authored a book with Scott McEwen, who was also well known. Uh, author of American Sniper, which was a movie that Clint Eastwood made as well. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of there's a lot of interesting stories that um, have surrounded you with your time over there, your time when you came back and your time for your decision to 
um, to go over there. I think, but my one of my first questions is: is what what preempted you to join the SEALs, which led you to your deployment in Afghanistan? Because that's a really um, that's a big decision. You know, we're not in a time where there's a there's a draft. Everything's volunteer. You go off and be a Navy SEAL, which is you know an incredible. Um, endeavor, a very hard thing to do and make a decision that may, you know, bring you in harm's way, which actually happened. So what was that, what was that motivation that, that started that? Well, um, so I, I grew up, uh, actually here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I'm, uh, recording right now. Mm. And, um, I, I grew up in a, in a, um, in a, in a very interesting household. So I grew up in a, um, a fundamentalist Christian, uh, household. Uh, you know, we couldn't, uh, couldn't go to movie theaters. Girls had to wear skirts. Uh, we couldn't listen to like music with like drum beats in it, stuff like that. So very, very Christian. Um, uh, g- good folks, good folks. It wasn't a cult or anything. It's like foot, folks. like like, um, f- like Footloose, right? Yeah, yeah, very much like Footloose. Yeah, that's a perfect example. I grew up in <laughs> no dancing. I grew up in Footloose town. <laughs> yeah, um, right. yeah, no, no talking to girls, none of that stuff. All right. Um, so, but but with that though, there was a big there was a big um, pull on serving other people. There was, that was, you know, as part of our Christian faith, um, there was a big focus on, hey, serving other people, um, making the world a better place, um, filling the world with more peace, right? Well, then on the other hand, my father, he was um, actually in the Air Force, serves my entire uh, childhood. And when, um, after 9-11, my father was, uh, deplo- or was activated to active duty service and then sent over to Iraq in 2003. Uh, he flew a C-130 Hercules uh, transport planes. And so because of that, I was kind of aware of the military and I was kind of very hyper aware of the wars that were going on. Um, and right around the age of 15 or 16, um, I, I kind of realized that the, the, I guess, extreme religious side of things just wasn't going to be for me. Um, and I knew I didn't want to go to like be a pastor or something like that. And uh, so I started looking, I was like, well, what could I do maybe in the military? Cause I can serve other people. I can help other people in that, in that, in that way. And, um, so yeah, right around the age of 14 or 15 or 16, I forget exactly when it was, but I just started really getting interested in the military. I I had watched Black Hawk Down, right? So I knew about Rangers. I knew about Delta Force. And so I was like, man, I'm going to go be a Ranger. Um, so I was doing a bunch of research on, on Ranger stuff and, uh, this this stuff for SEALs would always pop up, you know, when you're, when you're Googling and looking at Ranger stuff. And I remember I would always tell myself, I would see the SEAL stuff in the back of my mind. I'd always say, oh, I can't do that. I couldn't do that because, you know, those guys are crazy. Like, you know, those are right. SEALs. Like, that's absurd. Um, their training's like, crazy. I'm not even that good of a swimmer. And, like, so the thought, I always told myself I couldn't do it. But I guess um, I literally, I just had an epiphany one day. Um, and I realized, I was like, man, why? What, what kind of a soldier would I be? if I was backing down from the challenge of being a SEAL because I was too afraid or I told myself I couldn't do that, what kind of soldier, what kind of warrior would I be if I was backing down from that challenge? And so for me, I knew that the SEALs were going to be the most challenging for me. And um, so I counterintuitively, I was like, well, my, my, my chances of success are the lowest by going to the SEALs. So that's exactly where I'm going to go because I, I want to go um, prove that I'm the best and I want to, well, I want to work with the best guys and I want to do the hardest and toughest missions and the most important stuff. Mm. And so, yeah, right around the age of, uh, 15, I was like, well, I'm going to go do this. And then from that moment forward, there was no looking back. So some, of, to go. so some of your initial influence was through popular culture, watching films, seeing some, seeing how the military might have been portrayed through, you know, movies, et cetera, TV. That was how, was that your initial influence or is it well, just? Yeah. Well, 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 my father, my father being in the military, he would talk mm. to me a lot about the military stuff and he would tell me about the soldiers. So he was, he was in the air force and, you know, <laughs> transport planes, but he would tell me about the soldiers he was transporting around and we'd get photos from Iraq and you know, Kuwait and these other places where he was flying around. Mm. And so I was just very aware of the military being like a very real, real thing. And, um, you know, they would always have these really cool static displays at the, um, at the local airport down here Mm -hmm. in Milwaukee, where they'd bring in fighter jets and transport planes and all and tanks and all kinds of cool stuff. And, you know, they'd bring the community come out, could come out and kind of climb all over the planes and look inside the tanks and helicopters. And so I was very aware of it in that, in that sense. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, movies and, uh, and, you know, band of brothers, Black Hawk down, 
uh, Saving Private Ryan, man. I saw those movies and I was like, man, like I would love to be one of those guys. What was and, uh, um, yes, that was definitely how, a big influence. Right, right. What? How how long before this this interest this spark to join was this before nine eleven? How how long before that? No, this was this was this was after nine eleven. It happened um, after nine eleven. Yeah, yeah. So I was, um, I don't know. I was. I think I was in fourth grade. Yeah, I was in fourth grade when nine eleven happened. Okay. Um, and so because of that, there was like I definitely that was I think where a lot of my patriotism came from. I I saw what happened. I didn't understand what you know what it meant at all. It was you know nine. Um, but then two years later. You know, fast forward two years, my dad's getting activated and going to this place called Iraq. And I'm like, well, where's that? What's that? You know, and I'm learning about, oh, like, oh there's a war on. There's bad guys over there. And, um, yeah, so then I was like, oh, well, I mean, if if other guys are going to go fight the bad guys, like, well, why not me? So was 9-11 an influencer for you? Or was it just um, was you, as, was you, as, because yes, your dad went as, your dad went over there? Well, as I got older and when I, when I really started understanding what 9-11 was, it absolutely was a, was a motivator for me. But, but on the actual date of 9-11, I was, yeah, nine in, in Wisconsin. Right. And I was like, where's New York? I, yeah, I, I know, really I'm, not, know I'm, not, I'm not recognizing how old I am in contrast to you. So I'm, I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting mixed up with a 9-11 time frame. But, you know, it's interesting to know how, you know, because I know, I know a number of stories where people, you know, terrorist attack in new york people sign up and they go um and they have a certain perception and then they get over there and maybe that perception is the same or that perception may change i don't know what it was for you so you go through the navy seal training and then how after how far along after your training do you end up in afghanistan how long is that how long does that take so the, the the training to become a seal actually so from the from the moment that i joined the navy mm. uh, i was december 8th 2010 the moment that I actually checked into my SEAL team after having completing was December 9th, 2012. So it was just over two years. Uh, but you also have to factor in <coughs> I was injured for four months there. So it's like it's it's a, over a year and a half of constant training just to get to your SEAL team. Once you're at your SEAL team, you then have to go through another um, 18 months of pre deploying with, with an actual SEAL platoon with veteran SEALs. And you, you start to learn all the tactics. You learn your job within the unit so whether you're a radio man or you're a sniper or you're a medic you learn all those skill sets and then you train as a team and then you deploy so um, from the time that i joined the military to the time that i was actually stepping on a plane going to afghanistan was three and a half years of just constant training that's a lot of training out there that's a lot of yeah that's well a i mean that's of... what <laughs> Well, that's, yeah, that's that's what it means to be in special operations, not just the SEALs. I mean, the Rangers, Green Berets, same thing, man. Lots and lots of training. And 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 you were a medic, right? No, see, the funny thing is, I was not a medic. Um, I was mostly a comms guy and a JTAG, which means I, I controlled aircraft and called in airstrikes and things like that. Um, <coughs> but then when I um, got back from Afghanistan, I was able to get qualified as a sniper. And then when I went to Iraq after the military. Um, I ended up kind of just filling in the role of medic because we had received a ton of um, medical training, uh, you know, obviously in the in the in the SEAL teams. And when you went over to Afghanistan, did you feel? Did you? I mean, I, nothing can prepare you for what you m probably experienced. I know, I can't imagine what you probably went through. But did you feel? Did you feel somewhat prepared to enter that realm? When yeah, when I when I got to Afghanistan. Stand and went out on my on my first mission. To be perfectly honest, I felt totally comfortable. Felt, I felt totally prepared. I was like, I got this. It was and it wasn't like a cocky proof. You know, we're gonna kick these guys' butts. It was just, yeah, I know what to do. I've done this a thousand times. I've, you know, loaded. I've loaded my rifle and packed my packed my gear and walked out in formation a thousand times during that. You know, uh, three and a half years of training. You know, and that's why when you do get into combat, the, the, the reason why special operations forces are different is because you were trained so, so much that when you actually do go into combat, it's like, oh, OK, yeah, I've seen this. The only thing different is now there's bullets coming back at you. Um, right. But 
that's i mean you already you, you don't really act any different though it's like oh yeah this is this is what we do we return fire we get to cover right um you know yeah, you've, you've been in, you've, yeah. you've been in the simulation a thousand times now can you just can you relax enough to apply what you've learned in the real time event exactly and, and 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 get your and get your mind adjusted so you get there um what was your what was your first role your first purpose when you guys were there what what was what was going on as far as what was our what was our team's mission and yeah what and was that, when you, what was what was your what was your your mission when you, when you got there what was your gotcha. was it, um yeah so our so at, at the time the the strategy was to enable and build up the afghani army and the afghani forces to enable them to defend themselves so i was uh assigned to what was called a, a dsp a district stability platform which is essentially a small compound of about uh, 50 or 60 men out in the middle of nowhere, um, surrounded just by Afghanis. And on that little compound, um, we had Afghan special forces who we would accompany and lead um, onto, uh, onto combat operations. And so our, our, our mission was to build up their, their, their war fighting capability, but then the overall mission was to work with them to stop um, the weapons and um, personnel coming in from Pakistan, um, from the Haqqani network. Uh, the Haqqani uh, network are a Pashtun tribe that were um, that that operate both in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. That's their sort of ancient tribal land. They don't really recognize the borders, mm. and so our DSP, which is this little compound, was uh, right at the mouth of this large valley that went right into Pakistan. And so, um, but we were also positioned right between that, that sort of funnel of weapons and, and, and manpower and this large U S military base where there's aircraft and there's helicopters and there's, you know, hundreds of soldiers and, um, you know, th they've got a lot of different things going on at that very large base. Mm -hmm. So our mission, our larger mission was to basically, um, defend that base long enough so they could, I guess, break it down. Uh, and burn it and burn it and leave because uh, at the time <laughs> we were drawing down troops it was very weird we were fighting in this war where we knew in six months we're all going to be out of here and we knew we were we knew that that area was lost it was just completely lost like the, was the this, taliban were going to take it over right and take was this, it back. was this going on at the same time when they were when saddam hussein was still in power or was it afterwards no, so so Saddam Hussein had been killed, um, you know, years earlier in mm -hmm. um, in Iraq, and so he didn't have any influence on what was going on in Afghanistan. This um, is all. This the, is all. The, the, this is all the fallout from all that is really what this was about at the time. Um, so the the reason we went into Afghanistan was because um, the Taliban, who were like the local, I guess I, I guess the best way to describe, it, they're the local warlords who control Afghanistan, mm. uh, the entire country. Um, they had harbored um, Osama bin Laden, who had, um, you know, obviously uh, planned and coordinated and conducted, or not not personally conducted, but the attack, the nine eleven attacks. That's why we went into Afghanistan. Um, the Iraq situation was not necessarily linked to Afghanistan in, in any way. So, so Saddam Hussein, um, had no real, uh, no real bearing on what was going on in Afghanistan, two totally separate countries. They don't, you know, they don't share a border. Um, right. but it's all the same, it's all the same, you know, same part of the world. Right. Um, but but they, similar enemies, but there were certain influences you know with with iraq and afghanistan like why we were in that 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 section of the world i mean did did were mm -hmm. you were you briefed at all geopolitically why you were there or you were just briefed this is our mission this is what we need to do and i guess the next question is is what did you learn from being on the ground i mean did you was your perception of why we were there did that change why you were there fighting doing your I mission or uh, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I get you. I get you. So uh, to answer your first question, uh, yeah, I mean, we were briefed a little bit geopolitically on like the overall concept of why we were there in Afghanistan. But I mean, by the time I got there in 2014, though, I mean, we had been there since I think late 2001. Um, so we'd already been there for, you know, well over a decade. And so, we, I mean, we all kind of understood 
already what was going on. It was there wasn't a, a big you know there wasn't a big brief where they talked about nine eleven or anything because we all already kind of knew that. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I, I think my 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 perspective changed when I got on the ground. Um, only in as much as I started to realize that while our intentions were good and the overall strategy was good, the only way to make it actually happen would be to do a couple things. One, be prepared to be there for 25 or 30 years and control the entire area. And two, um, take out all the, you know, occupy all the tribal lands in all the neighboring countries as well. Right. Um, so if we if you did that and you sat there for thirty years and reeducated the you know the the population not reeducated but um, built schools and let let you know a generation and a half of of kids grow up under peaceful relatively peaceful conditions let them be educated on um, I guess the 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 values of democracy um, right. then then you could have some kind of a lasting impact but you know this isn't World War Two you're not going in there and fighting for four or five years until you reach Berlin and then it's over. Right. It's like, no, the, the, it, this, this will last for generations and generations. And mm -hmm. so again, our strategy I think was, was correct, but the resources and the ability to stay there for 30 years in an entire area. And not to mention, you have to get the tribal areas that are across these national borders, which we as Americans recognize, but, but it doesn't recognize they don't care little lines in the sand they don't care they don't care about it at all they're like man hey man my people have lived over there and over here for the last you know three thousand years of recorded history mm -hmm. um so yeah you can draw some line in the sand but we're still gonna cross it like we don't care and there's right. no and no security forces can get out there yeah you know, you're in the, middle and, of the mountains or whatever and you know and, and and when you when the military did go into the middle east during that time it wasn't really sold to the public as a 30-year war it was sold as you know we need to go in there we need to stabilize we need to stop terrorism we need to get out so there are a lot of other background reasons why all that fighting was going on um in the middle east and sounds like you learned a fair bit more about it when you started experiencing what was going on do you think that promoting democracy and stability in that region was the main purpose to go in or was it to to secure the area so the flow of oil kept on going? What 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 was your impression? I mean, I don't think anybody has, um, you know, a, as a layman looking in, people watch the news, they read the papers, nobody knows exactly what's going on, but someone that's being there and is quite as intelligent as you are can start formulating a little bit of a map in your mind about really what was going on. What do you, what do you think about some of that? Um, so I have two, uh, two main thoughts. And I think the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq are two very different animals. So the, the war in Afghanistan, um, I believe was a, was a, um, was worthwhile and was a good thing to go in there and take out these terrorists and not allow them to have a safe haven to conduct another, um, attack of that magnitude in the United States. So, uh, it, and, and that regards, um, yes, I, I agree with that. I don't think, but I, I don't believe that when we went in there, we understood the magnitude and the length of what of what was going to be required of us. Think about in the aftermath of World War II, we actually occupied all of Japan and completely rebuilt the country, reset up a you know set up set up a whole new government, um, conducted war crimes trials, and then I think within like four or five years, I believe um, we were out of there by the early fifties or you know by nineteen fifty or something like that. We were out right. of there, and Japan is this thriving nation. That's our point of view. That's our view of history. When we went into Afghanistan, we're like, oh, we're just going to do the same thing in Afghanistan. But that's not that's not realistic. Um, so I think the objective was to secure Afghanistan and help make them stabilized and make sure that the military there can get me or not allow more um, terrorist Terror training so. camps and things like that to happen. There. Now, Iraq, different situation. Um, the the situation in Iraq, I believe we went in on season we were looking for weapons of mass destruction. Right. Um, and I believe a lot of that had to do with, again, stabilizing the region. And um, I, 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 I feel I'm 50-50 on it. Um, I, I can see the argument to go in and take out Saddam Hussein. I totally see it. Um, I, and I get it. I get where we're coming from there. Um, but I can also see the argument of 
pe- when people say like, hey, why do we go in there? That's a bit ridiculous. Um, I, I, I honestly can see both sides of the coin. Um, but I, I do think it's important, though, that we have some kind of a presence in the Middle East to stabilize it because of the oil. OK, so, for example, yeah. why aren't we in why aren't we in, uh, you know, Africa conducting right. these large scale wars in Africa? Right. Well, there's just as much evil, just as much, maybe not weapons of mass destruction, but death and slaughter and rape and murder on, on these horrible scales going on all the time, all over the continent. Why aren't we there helping them? Right. Well, the reason is, you were kind of alluding to, there, there's more of a reason to be in the Middle East and it has to do with um, the stability of oil. Now, people, a, a lot of people look and say, oh, like we're just fighting wars over oil. There's no reason to do that. Well, to an extent, there kind of is because we and the Middle East and the rest of the world, we all form a kind of biotic relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever happens to one affects the other. And so if the Middle East is unstable and it's just going absolutely haywire, well, you know, if, 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 and, and if they just suddenly decided to cut off oil to the United States, let's say, or cause some big war where, you know, oil stopped flowing to the U.S., and give it, I mean, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but, you know, dude, give it three days of people lined up in the streets. Our economy stops. Our vehicles stop. No one's going to work anymore. We're standing in line outside of gas stations hoping to get a half a gallon of gas, right? right. We would be screaming for war. We'd be screaming to go in and invade these countries because that would then re-stabilize everything. So mm. a war well, question- that's motivated kind of by oil isn't just about oil. It's more about the economy and it's about the entire welfare of our of our society sure and stabilizing mean, the question the question is really you know how unstable the region was you know before we went in and you know i don't think anybody will 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 really know that and obviously 911 was a catalyst to move in that direction because of what happened in this country and that horrible tragedy and and, and maybe there was more thought by the government that you know more terror cells could pop up you know and more tragedy could occur um i don't think anybody would know Mm. i don't know i don't know if you know but it's definitely a very very confusing topic but interesting to hear you know your perspective on how your mindset might have changed i mean when you were once you got there did you say to yourself what what the hell am i doing here or um, what when i was in afghanistan yeah i mean we you were aligned with your purpose emotionally or yeah absolutely i was i was totally aligned with my purpose emotionally absolutely i was i was there i was committed i i I got it. I understood it. And I was like, okay, I, I see what we have to do here. I see what's going on. Um, with that being said, though, there were, there were certainly some, I guess, frustration because we were basically, we, we had been told when you guys go out here, you're going to be out here for a few months. And then at the end of this few months, you're going to hop on a bunch of helicopters, burn this entire place to the ground, and you're going to fly back to the big base and you'll never return here again. So it was weird. Um, kind of fighting a war that you know you kind of lost in, in a way. Um, because, I mean, the Taliban, the Taliban control the area. You, you want to talk about a briefing. When we first got to Afghanistan, they had an intel person come in. They put up a big map on the wall of the entire, uh, of, of, of all of Afghanistan. And they started showing us all the different regions where American troops were present. And then they and then we were like, okay, well, what about these other areas where the where the Americans aren't present? Like, oh, those are all 100 percent Taliban controlled. And we're in the process of losing this just of this area. We're in the process of losing this area. And they just pointed it everywhere on the map. And it was like, oh, dude, like we're not we're not going to be able to control the territory. Um, So I have I have two two important thoughts that people need to um, understand about, I guess, modern warfare and this kind of war. Into the future, I think our, our current policy is good, um, where you have a, so for example, in Afghanistan, you have, we have Bagram Air Base, which is this very large, um, it's, it's almost like a small city um, near Kabul, um, and you have aircraft there, you have special operations troops there, you've got medical people there, and so you have this quick strike capability, you can be anywhere in the country take out anybody who causes any real problems and you have special forces and rangers out there constantly putting pressure on the bad guys in these different areas within Afghanistan. So under those conditions, air training camps and all that stuff are not going to be able to flourish. Right. And it's, and it's a very small contingent of volunteer troops that really want to be there. These special operations, these fighter pilots, they want to be there. They want to go hunt down the bad guys. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But then going back to the Iraq thing a little bit, hindsight's always 20, 20. But 
I think we have to learn from history as well. So in, in the current situation, we have like Assad who's in Syria and he's this absolutely terrible, horrible human being, right? right. Uh, doing terrible things to his people. Very much the same way that Saddam Hussein was. So the answer, so the question is, okay, so do we go take out Assad? Well, the truth and, and or my opinion is when you look at the Middle East and you look at the cultures that are there and you look at sort of the, the ancient power hierarchies that have been there for thousands of years, you know, as Americans, we look at our, our history only goes back a couple hundred years. These right. other people, their history goes back thousands of years. Right. right. And there's a way of doing things like they're, they're walking down the same streets that, you know, like, you know, in, in Egypt or whatever, like, you know, now they're, 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 they're walking down the same streets that Alexander the Great walked down and, and Ptolemy. Right. So it's a very different concept of of ch change happens a lot slower. Um, mm -hmm. And so with that being said, if you go in there with that being said, there there are a lot of these cultures, not not everybody, but a lot of these cultures are simply not ready for um, democracy as we understand it. Right. Unfortunately, the reality is a strong, sometimes even abuse, uh, sometimes abusive leader, unfortunately, is the most stable thing that could happen there. Right. Because right. look at what happened to Iraq in 2000. Or we, so we, we go in in 2003, we take out Saddam, we're there for eight years. And 2011, we, you know, pick up and leave. Well, now there's this huge power vacuum. And they're not sitting there going like, oh, let's have elections. The Americans are gone. It's all good. That's fine. Let's have some elections and let's let's modernize. No, no, no. Like the 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 culture and the society and their and the terror elements in there are way too strong um, to have any kind of um, reorganization. Kind occur. Of, I guess <laughs> organized. Yeah, organized. Yeah, organized elections are so or, so. A lot of a lot of a yeah. lot of a lot of the hate that occurred towards the West probably occurred um, just because of our continued involvement in the Middle East after the last 20, 30 years. And as we you and I have discussed, most likely we revolved around trying to stabilize the area, but also because there's a resource there that's very important to the mm -hmm. to the world geopolitical economy. I get that. Um, I don't want to go off too far into a political discussion because this interview is also really about you as well, um, or mm -hmm. it really is about you. Um, so you're there and you're, you know, fighting alongside your um, other partners, other soldiers. Um, how are those guys feeling about all this? Is everybody is everybody in it together or are people like, what the hell am I doing here? Do you do you see some of that amongst the ranks? As, uh, as far as the SEALs were concerned, no, man, we were, <laughs> we were right. stoked to be there. We were all about it. Um, but the Afghan forces that we were working with, they knew we were leaving in a few months. And so what actually ended up happening was there was actually a lot of thievery that was happening. They knew we're leaving. They know we're going to take all of our gear with us. And so everything down from like batteries to fuel to, you know, ammunition, um, they, they started stealing it because they're like, dude, you guys are going to leave us in six or, you know, not even six months, three months. And, you know, like we're going to be left without all this stuff. And so there was a there was a huge morale problem with them. Um, and discipline problem um, because they, they were actually going to our vehicles. We'd fuel up a vehicle uh, preparing to go. This had actually happened. We, were, we filled up our vehicles the night before, 100% ready to go. And in the morning at like 3 a.m., we were setting off to go on another mission and mm -hmm. we were going to drive to our target. Um, well, we get, uh, we get driving and one of the uh, Afghan vehicles up front just stops working magically. And we're like, well, why, is, why isn't it working? So we all have to get out of our vehicles. You know, we're sitting there. It's actually raining. And in the night, we're just sitting there in this alley or this this because uh, somebody took a distributor uh, cap off. Area. <laughs> well, what happened was they, they siphoned out the fuel. One of the Afghanis went there in the night before the night before the mission because he knew there was a full tank of gas. He siphoned out all the fuel, and so he go wow. sell it on the market somewhere. And they mm -hmm. would do the same thing in firefights. We would get into gunfights and down. I have I have helmet cam footage of this. It was the most bizarre thing. You know, where are my like where are my bullets? Contact. Yeah, well, no, you no, you look down and they're just like sitting there. They're not shooting. They're not returning fire. They're they would literally just like sit down and like just camp out while we're taking like you know contact from multiple angles. And the reason was, after the gunfight, they would come up to us and say, "Hey, we shot all of our bullet ammo." We're like, "No, you didn't. Like, we saw you. <laughs> like, you weren't shooting at all, man." They were saving um, the ammo. But they were, they were, yeah, they're saving the ammo, taking taking whatever they could get. Yeah. All right. So how does so how does 
six months in Afghanistan turned into 6.4 years. Did you go back and forth or you were actually there for all that time? How, how often did you come oh, back? Oh, no. I, so I no, I went to Afghanistan one time and that was right at the end. That was my first deployment. And that was right at the end of Naval Special Warfare's involvement there, mm -hmm. at least for the vanilla teams. Um, and no, so my, so when I, when I returned from Afghanistan, um, we began, an, you begin another of 18 months of training. So you start, you get, you get a whole new group of, uh, you're, you're assigned to a new group of SEALs, you know, senior leaders that got promoted, they're moving on to other locations. You get new guy to training and you form a whole new platoon. And then at that point you spend 18 months relearning everything that you already know, but like you're, um, getting up to speed on the latest tactics. You're learning how to work together with your unit with this, with this new platoon. And then my, so my second deployment at the end of those 18 months was actually to uh, Southeast Asia, where basically what we did for six months was uh, training allied forces um, right. to help, help them combat terrorism. But it wasn't, um, there wasn't a whole lot of actual um, missions happening and um, there was never like a, so how did you didn't get into combat or anything like that? So how did you lead up to the time that you left the military and then you pivoted and then decided to go back to I you went not go back but go to Iraq to work with the Iraqi soldiers mm -hmm. and become a humanitarian warrior? I mean, how did that happen? How um, did it occur? And how did so you decide that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I guess I decided it in very much the same way that I decided to be a SEAL. Um, I just kind of like one day just made the decision to go. But so the, but the motivation behind it was during my time in Afghanistan, um, as as great of a time as I had, I and mean, we, had, we had a really successful, positive deployment. Um, I, 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 was, I was very frustrated with the 18 months that I, after I got home from Afghanistan. So for 18 months... ISIS was in full swing. This is 2015 going into 2016. And I was like, well, I was like, man, I'm already trained. Like, just send me to Iraq. Like, you know, like there's, there's bad guys over there. You know, there's tons of bad guys. Like, why don't we just send a ton of seals and send a bunch of Rangers and green berets, like send us over, like, let us go crush these fools. And there were guys over there, but there were, you know, there were troop limits. Um, so, you know, my, uh, I, I didn't get to go. And I was right. like, well, that's kind of frustrating. So I spent another 18 months of training. And then, so during my second deployment in Southeast Asia, um, I was doing a bunch of different research on different wars that were going on, different conflicts around the planet, especially in the Southeast Asia area. And I was like, you know, at, at one point we were in we were in Thailand, and I and I knew I was like, dude, if you know, we we are a forty five minute helicopter flight um, across the border into Burma, where there's uh, genocide happening, rape, murder. These this evil government is oppressing and killing people, um, burning people alive. And we're, and we're sitting here doing nothing. We're sitting here training with like the Thai military, which those are good guys. But it was like, I didn't sign up to train other people. Like, you know, at the time I was, uh, 24. Yeah. So I was 24 and I'm like, dude, like I'm young. Let's, let's, like, let's go. Got a lot of I got a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm fully trained. I've got like combat experience. Like let's go hunt these bad guys down and take them out. Cause but more importantly, there's people that need help. Like nobody's helping these people. Right. And so I guess just over time, I just realized I, you know, the interesting thing about being in the military is you can see your future. Um, you can see, you know, once you make the next rank, rank be essentially where you're going to be within the platoon structure, uh, within the training staff, like, you know, exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, once you make chief and senior chief and master chief, you know, ex you know exactly what's going to happen. And I just saw that. I just saw where the guys who were farther down the line than me were. And I was like, yeah, no, thanks. I'm good. Um, and I was like, I'm, I signed up to, to go help people. Um, mm -hmm. Again, going back to my childhood, I, was, I, I joined the military originally for very, very altruistic reasons. And so I just saw, I, I saw that the war in Iraq was going on. And I was like, well, I'm, they're not going to send me. So I was like, well, um, you know, people need help. And I can go over there and I guess work as a human humanitarian you know that was kind of like it was kind of a guess and it was like man i i was I mean, like that's, if, I, if i don't if i don't go over there i'm gonna not be able to live with myself i mean that's 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 quite a quite a decision and and really admirable of you because most people 
pulling back from that type of situation would say to themselves, you know, I don't want to risk get in harm's way and, you know, get hurt. I want to go back to my family. But you make a decision not based on the fact that you're a soldier. You make a decision that you want to go back into that chaotic region because you want to help the innocent people on the ground. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I wanted you just went you help as a soldier but because I was a human. Yeah, right. you're absolutely right. And the and and so 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 for me the, the way that I look at it though, yeah, I mean yeah, I was putting myself in harm's way and yes, that's that's where I was going to, but if if, if it can operate and handle being in that environment, it's me. You know, cuz I'm like I'm trained for this, right? Um mm-hmm. And then the second thought is, man, yeah, it's dangerous over there for me. All the like kids. What about all the innocent women and children that are caught in the middle of all this? What about um, the old men? And you know, defend themselves. Like, what about the old women? Like, you know, like what, what about about the people? Nobody's helping the people. Everybody's so focused on fighting, right? Being the people in between. And right, so, cause I was you know, like, you well, because I just want to say something. Go help. I just want to just add something because I think this is really important in the crux to our interview and why I wanted to talk to you. You know, here back in the States, when you were listening to the news, listening to TV, reading the papers, you weren't you weren't hearing so much about what was happening to the people on the ground. And I think that it's really interesting and, you know, a compliment to you that, you know, your mindset changed a little bit and it wasn't about just liberating that area for the United States or other geopolitical interests, your primary interest on the ground there became the people that were in harm's way and were collateral damage to what this conflict was causing over there. And that's what really motivated you as a human being. And I think that really is what I find very, very interesting and and very, very human about your story and about you as a person. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, so obviously we'll we'll get into more detail on what happened when I got over there in Iraq, but people always ask me, they they say stuff like, well, why would you go do that? Courageous of you or this, that, the other thing. But then I, but then I always tell them, I'm like, look, um, you know, if that was your kid that was out there, I guarantee you, you would go no matter the risk, no matter what, you might have to sacrifice no matter what could happen to you. It doesn't matter. You're going you're gonna to go. You're going to go and you're going to do whatever you can to help them. And But it wasn't we, your children. But, they, but how, they, they weren't your children, though. They were oh, exactly. other people's but, children. But here's, but here's my thought. But, but are they? Like, you know what I, mean? but like, I get it. That's, get that's it. my point. Like, mm-hmm. If you truly believe that you know, like we as humans are all brothers and sisters, you know, and growing up in a Christian household, it was always, um, you know, we were always taught that we're all brothers and sisters we're all all, we are all the children of god um we used to sing the song as a kid red and yellow black and white we are precious in his sight you know referring to jesus um it it was like dude like it it doesn't matter so like whether that is my kid or not my kid or whatever that's a kid that's somebody's kid and somebody has to help him and i I don't have kids i don't understand that you know the full bond there but um the point is they they're real people too they need help and so for me it was like I'm going to go, I, I have the ability to help. And if I don't help, if I don't help, then shame on me because I have the ability to actually go and help. Whereas were other there, people were there might other, care, were, but they can't. Were there other, were there other seals or soldiers such as yourself that were doing the same thing? Were they far in, in between? How did, what did you find when you got back to, when you, yeah, when you so got to Iraq? When, yeah. So when I, when I, when I went over there, I joined up with a group of other uh, humanitarians that were out there doing some, uh, do, doing, doing uh, lots of good work. Um, and a lot of them were, uh, former military guys as well. None of them, none of them seals. Um, and yeah, it was like, I definitely wasn't the only one over there. And then if you look at what's interesting too, about the war on ISIS is especially like in Syria and other parts of Iraq, uh, there was a lot of Western volunteers, even people who had never been in the military, um, who went and volunteered to fight ISIS. Cause it was, if you look at ISIS, ISIS is essentially our generation's Nazis, you know, like we haven't seen a group that evil since the Nazis existed. And imagine if you were alive back in the early forties and you like, you had the opportunity to go fight the Nazis. Like that would be like such, 
that would be like I mean that would be such an honor that would be such a, a such a drive such an important mission to go do and such a great thing to be a part of stopping those evil men well well ISIS is here or I, ISIS was there and so I wanted to be a part of that and there were other guys too yeah so I, I embedded with um, a group of humanitarians who were out there um, you know handing out water bottles and doing the medical thing and and that and that whole and that whole deal and that's what I originally thought I'd be doing. Um, but we ended up embedding with the um, Iraqi army, and then the then the whole uh, the whole thing just blew up. <laughs> right, and then so you basically you got you basically were you went over there for humanitarian reasons, and and you you were involved in in that manner, but it got back into combat. It pulled you back into a combat type situation with these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so what we what we what we ended up doing was you know we were working alongside and. Iraqi um, armored division and who was tasked with um, going through and clearing a bunch of villages on the outskirts around Mosul. There's all these different little villages in the on the uh, plains of Nineveh, and uh, every time they would liberate a new uh, liberate a new area, obviously wounded in the fighting. Um, but then you would have a whole bunch of uh, civilians who were fleeing the fighting. Um, and many of them were sick. You know they don't have food. Where do they go? Um, and so we were there to help take care of them. And when the Iraqi army would make a push, they didn't have, they didn't have dedicated combat medics like we have. So our understanding, you know, in, in, our, in American movies, when you watch an American movie uh, and, a, and, a, uh, and a soldier gets hit, everybody starts either screaming medic or corpsman. Well, the Iraqis, they don't have that. They don't have an equivalent of that. So when your buddy gets shot, you just kind of sit there and you're like, ah, you know, they, they don't really know what to do. They have no training. And so we would we were there to um, to help them, uh, you know, when 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 guys were wounded. Yeah, we ended up um, on the front lines of the uh, of the fighting, and the unit we were with again was an armored unit. And it, when you, when you look at warfare, armored units work much better over flat terrain. You know, nice rolling hills. That's that's where they that's where they work well. Um, uh, armor. It doesn't work so well when you're going into an urban, a tight urban area. So we could see Mosul off in the distance. We heard the, you know, we could see the explosions and see the tracers every night kind of shooting up into the sky. We never thought we would actually go into and, that city, though, because we're like, this unit's not going to go in there. But that's not what happened. And this, <laughs> they and, this and this, to go and, in. and this was, and this was about Mosul because this is the city that ISIS believes was there. It's it's their holy it's their holy city. It's what they believe. It's what they were protecting. Is that correct? The uh, I I don't know if they consider it a holy city. I don't know enough about their ideology to know that. But M M uh, Mosul is where um, Al Baghdadi got up and claimed, um, or and and um, and I guess proclaimed the 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 formation of the caliphate, this new Islamic right. empire, the Islamic state. And um, so Mosul is kind of the ground zero of where it happened, uh, where things really, really started. And obviously it spread into Syria and there's still issues. Um, but yeah, Mosul was a, was a massive um, ISIS stronghold. Um, the people there, not all of them, but a good portion of the people were uh, very sympathetic with ISIS, unfortunately. But, and that's why they chose to go to Mosul. Um, and so for three years, they had full reign of that of the entire city. They were setting up industry. They were um, making you know their own. They were making their own weapons, making their own bullets. They had their own currency. But they were also it was this horrible, um, horribly evil place as well. The, the human trafficking and um, the butchering of humans and the super super strict Sharia law was was you know extremely enforced on the people. And, uh, yeah, it was a horrible, uh, devilish place. So by the time we got there, um, if you look at Mosul on a map, it's basically cut down the middle. And on the east side, it's cut, on, it's cut down the middle by the Tigris River. And on the east side of the river, that entire side had already been cleared of the ISIS. Um, electricity had been restored. Cars are driving around. People are going about their lives. But on the west side of the river, right. completely blacked out. And you have thousands and thousands of ISIS fighters just hiding in these buildings and waiting for an attack to come and clean. The, and and the 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 breakout of ISIS occurred and gained momentum after we um, liberated Iraq, got rid of Saddam Hussein. That's when that's when it really started to 
to develop and get really chaotic. And ISIS sort of came to be and, and, and recognized more. I mean, we started hearing about it more in the United States. It was, it was after our involvement there. It wasn't so much before. Mm hmm is that correct? Mm -hmm. And you told me you that, told that me you, you told me that they were also the leader, the mention the guy that you mentioned his name. I, I can't even pronounce his name, but you told Baghdadi, me that yeah. yeah, you told me that a lot of the guys, a lot of the organizers were in jail together, and they developed a mm -hmm. a number of, of rules and regulations and codes that they live by a a, a book, whatever, however you want a playbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they. So it was yeah. So the, you're absolutely right. ISIS wasn't a thing until until we uh, went in. So what happened though? ISIS wasn't so much of a formation that happened until sort of toward the end of our time in in Iraq. So when we when we went into Iraq, we pretty easily decimated the the entire Iraqi army. And so the way and we, and we occupied the entire country. And so the way that the uh, that the Al, Al Qaeda, the terrorist networks would fight back against us, they would use insurgent tactics. They're walking around in plain clothes. You know, they might, they'll plant a bomb, they'll throw a grenade there. Um, they'll occasionally do some kind of a complex ambush, but for the most part, they're, um, you know, it's, they're fighting an insurgency. And the only real, real crazy gunfights or, you know, or super crazy fights that would happen is when we would learn where they were at and we'd send in special ops guys to go take down that building. And then that's when the, these, uh, that's when the real gunfights, real, uh, crazy things would happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but what would happen is all around the country, we were going around and finding these different insurgent cells, right? Think of it like a, uh, like a, like a criminal cell, right? One cell doesn't know about the other cell, right? In case one leader gets captured, they can't give away everybody else, right? Everything was very staggered. But what was happening is, is we were capturing all these bad guys from all over, from all over Iraq. And then we were putting them in the same few, we were, we were putting them all basically into the same prison system. And so you've got guys from northern Iraq and from southern Iraq sharing a cell um, in, in some in some uh, in some jail, and of course their their fervor and hatred is they're just all, building and building and building. They're both. But, they're all. They're yeah, all but, pissed. But the, and they have a commonality of anger. The, oh, they're so pissed. And but the, now the problem is they can all just sit there and plan and scheme and talk about, hey man, when we get out of here, here's what we're gonna do. And I believe I'm not 100 percent sure, but I believe we actually had Baghdadi in captivity at one point. Um, and so you have all these guys and they're, they're talking about um, that they're, they're able to network and coordinate and, and all this stuff. Well, in 2011, we left when the Iraqi military was not ready to uh, secure the country. They were not ready to defend the country themselves. And so basically what happened is in, in late 2011, early 2012, um, all these ISIS guys broke out of prison. They all got out of there and they all scattered to, back to wherever their homes were or whatever. And over the next couple of years, they started planning um, their next big move. And al-Baghdadi emerged as the leader. And he made the decision, or he, or not, he personally didn't make the decision, but as a group, they made a decision, all right, we're going to start a country, basically. We're going to start our own country, ISIS land, you know, like, right. um, or the Islamic State, right? Yeah. Um, Anti-Disneyland, anti for sure. Is anti-Disneyland, exactly, yeah. So... But what's interesting about that is they're no longer fighting an insurgency, right? It's no longer little hit and run tactics. It's no longer little skirmishes that pop up. It's no longer just little roadside bombs. They're controlling a territory and they're going to fight for that territory just like, let's say, the German army did in World War II. They're was holding the, the ground. What was, their, what was their purpose, though, in holding that? that, that, that I mean, what, what, did they, what did they want to accomplish? I mean, obviously, the destabilization. Start their own country. Right, destabilization of that region. They saw a a hole. They saw an opportunity for them for whatever they believed in or whatever their you know, whatever their new their purpose was. That anger. Mm -hmm. They they wanted to they wanted to secure a region for themselves. A bunch of angry dudes want mm -hmm. to secure a region for themselves. Right. Exactly. And so the they what basically, if, if you look at the, the term ISIS, I S I S. Islamic State in Syria is what we refer to it as. The, 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 there's also ISIL, Islamic State in the Levant, which just means the East, Eastern Mediterranean, Middle East. Um, but the important two words are Islamic State. So, and the key word there is state. They want to create, their, their, their goal was to create an actual country um, that they controlled, um, just, like, just like America. They wanted, you know, they wanted their own borders. They wanted their own religion and language and everything they wanted to start their whole they wanted to you know uh start from scratch and build their own 
country. Um, and a very, a very it also fundamentalist. Has to do with a very fundamentalist right. foundation as well, too, and that was probably a, a big mm -hmm. port, part of their motivation. I mean, yes, very, they were thousands of years of ideology there. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, and their their goal was to create basically a country, an Islamic country. They wanted a country that was mm -hmm. ruled by what they call Sharia law, just basically uh, Islamic law. It's like imagine if the U.S. was just ran by you know, the Pope, right? That'd be Catholic law. Well, for them, they have, uh, you know, this Sharia law, this Islamic law. And that's, that's what they wanted. And so when we went in to flush them out, we're no longer dealing with an insurgency that's just doing, you know, just doing some roadside bombs and some snipers and some grenades here and there, you know, these random attacks. Now it's an entrenched, well dug in, well defended, well prepared, hardened enemy that w that will fight for every single inch of ground you know that are that, who will fight for every single inch of ground that we're trying to take back so what you're saying out. You, what you're saying is they were getting better at what they were doing 100 percent. and what's what's really interesting is so i you know i fought um um the you know i fought the taliban in afghanistan who were in insurgency or you know guerrilla warfare and then i fought isis and it was a totally different experience. It was a completely different. Um, it was a completely different enemy. They were using completely different tactics. They were fighting uh, a, basically a maneuver style warfare, which, which to them, which was, which was not a smart move. On. I think they calculated that we would not get involved. I think I think they calculated that the U.S. did not have the stomach uh, to get involved again. And that's why they made that decision, which was a terrible decision because you're just never going to beat the U.S. military on a, on a, on a just a normal yeah. conventional war, as they say. You just it's yeah. not going to happen. So you were you were basically saying that um, ISIS didn't feel that the U.S. had the stomach to to get involved with them. Yeah, I I don't know that from like official intel reports or anything, mm -hmm. but I'm guessing that's what was going on in their head because. Yeah, they secured a territory and tried to hold it with conventional means and with conventional style military. And they just had to have known, like, dude, there's no way you're going to beat us um, at that. The only way th that anybody successfully ever fought us is using insurgent guerrilla tactics. Right. Um, that's the only way that's ever worked. Right. So how you so how you became known to the general public? There was a video that was taken while you were in combat you were behind a tank and there was a shootout and a lot of innocent people were killed and you saved a father i believe and a little girl i don't know if it was the daughter or not but this video of you went viral seen by was seen by millions of people and was the catalyst for your book and also your mm -hmm. joint venture with scott McEwen. how did how did that come mm -hmm. to, can you tell me a little bit about that incident and how it led to that Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as I was saying, we were, you know, we were embedded with this, um, armored unit. Well, one day it was actually, it was May 4th, um, 2017. We, um, we found out that we, you know, we were going to be going into Mosul and, and so on May 4th, 2017, the, these, this entire Iraqi army, um, armor division lined up and just literally just full on world war two style everybody online charged the enemy lines kind of thing attacked western and when we got into the city um i over the over the first three days in the city i thought i was uh, we thought we were going to go out for about three hours cause that's usually how the iraqis fought they'd go out and fight for like three or four hours stop for <laughs> stop for lunch and not right. and <laughs> take then a break like, all right let's go back the next, yeah the next morning They'd get up, have some tea, like everybody good to go. All right, cool. So they go, you know, go from nine to noon every day, kind of thing. Um, wow, was, just like a way, of, anyway, I, like a way of life. I took a siesta, and then are right, you ready to go, Ephraim? Let's go. I'm, I had my cookies, yeah. I had my tea. Let's go. That's that's exactly what was going on. Uh, like their thing was hookah, though. They're always sitting there smoking hookah. Okay. Um, so they'd have like hookah bongs in there. <laughs> in their wow, so funny. Wow. Um, yeah. So. Uh, but so anyway, we thought we were going in. I thought it was going to be three a three hour maneuver as they would normally do. Um, but it ended, actually ended three straight days of constant fighting, um, constant um, um, 
assaults into ISIS territory. ISIS was killing civilians as they were coming out. We were treating people around the clock nonstop for the first three days. So during that, when I, during that time, May 4th through around uh, May, May 4th, 5th and 6th, 7th ish. Um, that's actually when I had the idea to write a book. I was like, I, I realized I was witnessing history because you also have to understand too, w- with the way that the war was being fought in Iraq against ISIS was there were small groups of um, special operations guys embedded with different elements of the Iraqi army, but they were their orders were to stay a thousand yards behind the actual fighting. Their job was not there to, they were not there to fight. They were there to support, provide overwatch, um, call in airstrikes or whatever um, for the Iraqi military, uh, talk with them about tactics, things like that. There was also a conventional army unit uh, that was there as well. So I knew what was happening was history, but I also knew there was no, there was no, um, you know, there were no uh, like American press there. Like, so that what was happening was going to be completely lost to the, to the, to the sands of history, the mm-hmm. sands of time. And that's, it was like, I need to write a book about this. I need to, I need to write about this. And what was interesting actually during high school and even during my time in the military, I've always been fascinated with the art of writing. And so mm-hmm. I'd read books on how to write books and countless blogs on how to write. And, you know, so it was very interesting. I was like, Oh, perfect. Here's a chance to write something. And, um, so anyway, 30 days later, um, we we were uh, we were called to an area um they, they knew we had the, the iraqis knew we had you know medical capabilities and stuff so they called us to an area in mosul and there was there were a lot of there were a lot of civilians that were coming through who had who were escaping isis territory and they they were wounded many of them were um i guess delirious there's just this look in people's eyes where they they just kind of like lost it um mm-hmm. in shock and uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of people coming through, but then there were there were uh, kids coming through who were wounded. There were, you know, women and and, and and old men. And I remember one one girl in particular. We we weren't sure what was happening. We thought that these were just random people kind of breaking out from ISIS, but we knew there was a big problem um, when this uh, a Humvee, an, an Iraqi army Humvee, pulled up. And uh, we knew that there was, you know, somebody wounded in the vehicle. Mm. So I went to the back and I opened up the Humvee to look inside and not in the seat directly in front of me, but on the other side of the vehicle, um, there was a little girl, maybe, you know, seven years old, if that, um, in this bright teal, bluish green dress. And um, I could see, I could just see by the color of her face that she'd already lost too much blood and she was sitting up straight like she was just riding along. Um, but I was like, Oh, like I, I, I saw that of course, and I was just, and I just realized like, Oh, this is happening now. Whatever, whatever's going on, all these people that are breaking through, this is happening. Like there's some sort of fight going on. There's like people are being attacked right now. Mm-hmm. And, um, they pulled the girl out of the vehicle um, they tried to do CPR on her, but um, she was she was already dead. She had lost way too much blood. Um, but uh, more and more people came through, and there was uh, one man in particular. He came by. He was he would look. He was in shock, and he had two other women with him. And as soon as he saw us, you know, there's you know maybe three or four um, Western guys, you know, and he he assumes we're American military. He doesn't you know know that we're just, you know, humanitarians because we're carrying guns and we've got, you know, ammo and medical stuff on us. So to him, we look like soldiers. But anyway, he sees us and he walks up to us. And as soon as he sees us, he just drops to the ground um, and starts crying. And there, our team leader, he actually caught the guy before he fell down. And the guy just starts weeping and he's weeping. And he couldn't stand. He was just shaking. And he he basically, he was... Our, our interpreter came up and it, talked to the guy and said, Hey, like, you know, Hey, what's going on? What's he trying to say? Cause the guy was just deliriously like screaming. Um, our interpreter told us, he said, um, ISIS just shot his two daughters in front of him. Oh my God. Um, wow. he said that they, they shot one of the girls and they blew her head off. And the guy was just weeping and so upset. And he kind of had this, he was finally able to let it out because he knew he was safe because he saw us. But um, I just can't even imagine this. 
This is horrible. Oh man, it was yeah, it was it was uh, it was horrible. But um, so we, we we heard that story from that guy, and we there's nothing we can do for him. Obviously, we um, he wasn't hurt. We gave him some water and um, said, hey, you know, sorry, man. Um, and he <laughs> continued on toward a refugee camp, just tears streaming down his face, just walking down this bombed out road. With why his, was uh, why was ISIS why was ISIS attacking just innocent people? Well, the the ISIS. IG, they follow a form of like extreme fundamentalist Islam, mm -hmm. um, where the one of the biggest sins is apostasy. So if you leave the religion, that's like one of the biggest sins. And so what they when they saw people leaving the Islamic State, leaving the territory that they were controlling, they um, they then had, I guess, according to their own moral twisted moral code, they had the go ahead then to kill those people because they were now apostates mm -hmm. but also on a tactical level they were doing they were deterring other people from trying to run away because right. they know that the u.s airstrikes and the iraqi army didn't want to kill civilians and so they're essentially making the people stay around them um as them as shield. human shield. shields yeah yeah, yeah. was this was was this this them. was this scene you're talking about was this the one that was picked up on the video that went viral on youtube no so that was that was the next day um, so mm -hmm. what happened was, um, uh, all, so for the rest of the day, we treated people and then for the entire night, we continued to treat people. People started just coming in out of the dark by ones and twos, um, with mostly, most of them were wounded at this point. Those are people who had been shot and had survived and had waited for dark to sneak out of the area and then come to the, um, Iraqi military. And so we were, so we spent the entire night, we'd sleep for, you know, sleep for a few minutes, just getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. And then an Iraqi soldier would come, you know, he would always come tap me on the shoulder, wake me up and I'd get the rest of the team up and we'd go outside with our, we'd put our red tactical lights on and out of the dark, just these people would just start appearing, um, with wounds and they're screaming and, um, and then we would treat them as best we could and, uh, evacuate them in our ambulance back to a, a, a proper, medical facility. Um, so that happened all throughout the night. And even at this point, I didn't fully understand the, um, full weight of what had happened. Mm -hmm. And so the next morning, the, uh, dawn comes and, um, we go down to sort of the end of this road that we're operating on and end of this road, it's a, it's an intersection and it's the six lane highway that went across where we were at. And when we got to the edge there, the, the Rocky soldiers were like, Hey, careful, careful. You know, ISIS is right over there. And so when we looked into this highway, we started seeing bodies, mm. um, one or two here and there, one or two here and there. These were, and these were, uh, freshly killed bodies. They weren't, um, bloating or rotting or anything like that. Um, so it means that they had just been killed within the last, mm. you know, 12 or 16 hours. And, so we realized, oh, all the people we saw yesterday, the story that man told us of the little girls who've been, who were, of his daughters who were killed, that all happened just yesterday afternoon. And we got up in the buildings, we started surveying the scene, and we saw, I mean, just dozens and dozens and dozens of bodies scattered everywhere. Um, there was, um, I remember, there was a, a man in a wheelchair, an old man in a wheelchair slumped over. Mm. He'd been executed while sitting in his wheelchair. There were just dozens of corpses of children and women and men. Um, there was a baby who was maybe, I don't know, six months old, if that. Its head had been bashed in. Um, oh it wasn't shot. The, Terrific. The, the parents, the parents, I think the father had been killed. I think the, the father had been carrying the, the, the baby, and they had both been shot. And I think when they were shot, the baby fell into the rubble and cracked its head open because it was laying there between its parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is what we saw. Well, in the middle of all this, there was a huge pile of bodies of maybe uh, a dozen or maybe 20 bodies up against a wall. And we started seeing movement and we realized there were uh, people still alive in the, in this pile of bodies. And upon closer inspection, we saw that, um, three, one, one, two, three, four, four of them were children and two of them were, um, adult men. Mm -hmm. And 
we saw this and we were like, oh man, we got we gotta we gotta go get them. The problem was where they were located was literally uh, maybe fifty or fifty to a hundred yards away from a four or five story um, ISIS stronghold. It was an old hospital that ISIS had taken over and was using to defend the entire area. And they had a whole, they had just probably, we, we, we were told there was about 200 human shields inside that hospital. The old patients and people who had been in there were being used as human shields. And mm -hmm. then the elevated position gave ISIS this firing position um, to shoot at all the different troops in the area. Um, so the point is we couldn't go out there and just try and get the, try and get these kids. We would 100% die. 100% you're going to get shot. You're right. 75 yards away from ISIS. And, uh, so what, what we put together a plan where, um, basically we wanted the Iraqi army to drive a tank down the road and we would ride in a Humvee behind them. And then we would hop out of the Humvee, grab the kids real quick, throw them in the vehicle. And then we'd all just, you know, uh, shooting, shooting as widely as we could, we would try and back out of there, um, you know, with these, with these patients. But the problem was the Iraqi army, they weren't going to send any Humvees. They weren't, they weren't having it. And so they decided they would give us one tank and our team leader, he actually called the, uh, general who was in the, who was in the, who was in charge of the area, the American uh, army general who was in charge of the area. And he requested a smoke screen. So the, the, uh, the military actually, the U S military actually put a drone overhead and so they could see even better than we could the, the amount of devastation because we couldn't see a lot of the bodies because they were like hidden in the rubble. Mm -hmm. But from an aerial point of view, they could see them all. And they realized like, oh, like th this, is, this is not good. Um, and so they agreed to give us a, uh, a, a smoke screen using artillery. Mm -hmm. And so this, the American military artillery battery starts firing the smoke screen. These, ar these uh, artillery shells come in. They explode in midair. And they send out this white phosphorus stuff that burns and throws up a throws up a smoke screen, and then the one Iraqi army tank um, that we had um, just drove straight down the street, right into the smoke screen, uh, right into ISIS territory, and we um, we ran behind. Uh, there were five of us, and we ran behind the uh, the tank to get up there. Uh, once we got into position behind the tank uh, basically parallel to where the uh where the this pile of bodies were and where the kids were um, by the time we got out there it was early afternoon and um three of the four kids that we had intended on rescuing had actually died already from heat exhaustion uh mm -hmm. had been they just basically had been cooked in the in the sun and so there's only one girl alive and these two adult men um well the 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 video that went viral um, was the team leader. Um, he ran out and grabbed the, he grabbed the little girl uh, while myself and uh, my buddy Sky Barkley, he's a former Marine. Um, he, uh, he and I, we jumped out behind the tank and laid down cover and fire, like basically point blank right into ISIS positions, which you can't see in the camera, but we we're firing right into, right into ISIS areas. Um, so our team leader, he got back with the girl and then we all, then we all went out with no cover fire to um, get the two men. Um, once we got the two men behind the tank, um, we realized like we needed to try and carry them out of there. Um, but the problem was there was so much rubble and debris. And I mean, at this point we're completely exhausted. Um, I, I found a, ironically, there was a, a, oddly, there was a, like a, this metal tabletop, which was sitting in the middle of the road. I had no idea why it was there. I'm assuming somebody else was carrying somebody on it. Um, but I, I put the guy that I was responsible for, he had been wounded uh, multiple times, like in the shoulder and chest area. So I knew there was, if I picked him up, his, his still had fresh blood. So I knew he would bleed out. So I threw him on this tabletop and started dragging the tabletop myself and the interpreter. Wow. Um, and, but what happened was the Iraqi army tank just started backing up and we had no, we had no communication with it. We had no way to tell it to stop. We had no way to tell it to slow down or anything. It just started backing up. Right. And so as we're backing up, we're trying to stay up. We're trying to stay ahead of it. But the, the guy that I was, the guy that I was in charge of, um, you know, trying to get out of there, he kept on slipping off of this tabletop. And so, um, I screamed to one of the other guys to come and pull the, 
and also nobody nobody from our team was returning fire at that point against ISIS and the smoke was starting to dissipate. And so um, one of the other guys came over and he started pulling the, pulling this tabletop thing. I tried to get the, the guy back on the table. Um, meanwhile, this tank is backing up on us. ISIS gunfire is coming in. And uh, so at this point, ISIS is like they're firing everything that they have at us. Um, they don't know exactly where we're at, um, but they're they're just firing blindly into the smoke. They also started dropping mortars, uh, which none of the video footage caught up, uh, caught. But there was mortars dropping and explosions going off. Um, and eventually, this guy, this guy, he fell, he fell off the table, and I and I, I went over to him, and I couldn't get to him in time to pick him up and put him back on the table. So literally, all I could do was grab him and roll him out of the way as this tank was backing up. It would have completely just it would have completely crushed him from from toes all the way up to his head. Um, so I moved him out of the way of the tank tread. And as soon as I moved him out of the way of the tank tread, he kind of like looked back up at me. He was on his back. And he looked up at me, you know, basically seeing if I was going to come get him. Um, but I knew that if I went on the side of the tank and went up there, um, I'd get shot. I, I knew it. Like there was no, I just looked at him. I was like, hey, man, I'm sorry. I can't. Like I just, I physically can't get you right now. If I try, come out there and try and get you, I will die. Right. Um, I was just kicking off of everything. Um, so yeah, I, I stepped back into position behind the tank and, uh, this, this, this was also caught on video. Um, I was just kind of walking backwards. I kind of stepped behind the tank and I'm kind of in shock because I just had to make this decision basically to leave this guy to die. Um, and I stepped back behind the tank and out of nowhere, um, a burst of machine gun fire comes in and, uh, my legs go out from underneath me. Mm. Um, I feel a bullet go through my, my right calf and, uh, I fell down um, right behind the tank. And I was, I was sitting there kind of like in, for, in momentary shock, just kind of like looking at my leg. Um, I knew I'd been shot. There was no like confusion there, but I, I wasn't sure if my bone had snapped or not. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it hit my bone. Um, so I kind of was just like looking at my leg for a split second and you can see in the video, the, the one of the guys, um, he started like, he started basically hitting me. He started pushing me like, dude, get up, get up, get up. And uh, so I turn around and sure enough, this tank is maybe about a second and a half away from running me over and uh, it's not stopping. So I popped back up. I had no other option. And um, luckily my bone wasn't hit. Um, so I was able to walk on the, on the wounded leg. And um, earlier in the day, um, when we were up in the buildings, we looked at and we were looking at all the different bodies in the street. We saw two girls who fit the description of the man from the day before laying next to each other. And one of the girls had been shot in the back of the head and the bullet had exited her face and uh. blown her entire face off from her head down to her jaw. So where her face was, or it had used to be was, uh, uh, just a black mass of dried blood and, and flesh. Um, <laughs> Dude, and, I gotta, I gotta stop you so, for a second. This is like one of the most intense stories I've ever heard before. I mean, I mean, the, I, I have anxiety. Just, I'm not making fun of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's really mm -hmm. intense. It's, it's just, it, it causes a lot of anxiety. But I'm just, it's a, it's a crazy, it's a crazy story, and I, I just can't believe what you had to, had to endure while you were there. And I, I really appreciate that you're. I just wanted to stop you for a second. You can continue. I just needed to interject for. A second, I mean, the, the, what you were up against and the bravery, and, and it's obvious why you're a hero. And I just really appreciate that you're you're sharing the story. Well, Thank I'm you. I'm I'm happy to talk about it. Um, it's a a bad a bad situation, a bad day, a bad thing. Um, but a little bit of a little bit of life came out of it, um, and I feel it's my responsibility, having survived it, to to tell the story and, and talk about what happened. Um, so go back and, to what you were yeah, saying. Yeah, so. Yeah, so right after I got shot, I was, um, I was walking backwards, throwing a tourniquet on my leg. I could see um, that the bullet had gone through. I, I could see that I had two bl – blood was coming from two different holes in my, in my calf and running down my leg. And it was bright, oxygenated blood, so I wasn't sure if I'd hit an artery or a vein or something. Um, and so I was throwing a – but as I was throwing the tourniquet on, I was walking backwards and I couldn't see – obviously where I was going and I ended up tripping over the body of that girl who had no face. The girl had been shot and I ended up tripping over her and looking straight down. I, I caught myself, but, um, I was looking straight down 
at uh, at her face. She was right right there, and um, you know, I just uh, kept going, uh, kept going backwards um, through the through the tourniquet on. Uh, we got down to the ed- end of the street, and um, ISIS was still you know shooting at us, and we had to cross back. We had to cross back across the um, the six lane highway. But the problem was ISIS would 100% shoot whoever tried to cross that highway. And at this point, we were moving way too slow. Uh, keep in mind, it's like 115, 120 degrees. The exhaust from the tank itself was literally burning the hair off of our hands because um, it was so hot. And um, so and I just so I just been hit and I started getting like really lightheaded. And I wasn't sure if it was from the heat or if it was just from the um, if it was from the blood loss. I wasn't sure what was going on. And so when we got to the end of the street, we had to cross the sick lane highway. Well, we started screaming for the Iraqis to send us a Humvee. We're like, hey, Humvee, Humvee's like, send us a Humvee. So we're screaming at them, like, send us a Humvee because the armor, you know, Humvee will actually be able to make it across the street. We can all load up into it and nobody else will get shot. Um, well, no, they weren't sending anybody. And so I didn't, we didn't have time to sit there and, and play any games. We, we just, there, there was no other option. And, um, I was, I was already hit. So I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm pretty much expendable at this point to the team, if you mm-hmm. will. Um, and then that I made, I was like, well, you know, if I go down, it doesn't matter. So I said, I'm going to move across the street. And, um, so I, uh, ran across the street as fast as I could on the wounded leg. And um, ISIS immediately opened fire, um, but you know it's pretty hard to hit a perpendicular um, moving target, especially if you're not expecting it. And so the, um, the the other guys, the other guys were watching. My buddy later told me he, he said he could see the uh, bullets landing uh, right behind my feet as the ISIS guys were trying to shoot me. Um, the bullets were just right, were just right behind me. It's crazy. Um, I, I made it across the street in one piece. Thank God. And I got up screaming. I was like, hey, send a Humvee, send a Humvee. And um, finally, the message got across. They were like, oh, they need a Humvee. And um, I saw someone hop in a Humvee and get ready to go out. So I was like, okay, cool. My mission is uh, my mission's accomplished. And at that point, the um, a couple of other medics from our team who weren't on the mission, uh, they cut my pant leg off, re- put on a new tourniquet, and twisted iodine-soaked gauze into both entry and exit wounds on my leg. Mm-hmm. Um and I was just like laying in the laying in the dust, and um, um, ironically, the what's the the cool part? My honestly, my favorite part of this whole story is um, there was a French journalist who was embedded with us at the time, and he was taking a lot of the photos and videos and things. When he heard that we needed a Humvee, he jumped into a Humvee, and was the one that went and rescued the team. So wow. this non-combatant, non-military just there to observe. He jumped in a Humvee after watching me get shot, drove straight out into the same area, loaded up the team and drove them back to safety. And I'm like that. I, I have absolutely the utmost respect for this guy. Was he and, the one that was he the one that uh, took the video of you getting shot? Uh, the one that went viral? He, um, no. So the guy who was up close, we actually had a guy who went us, who, who was with us behind the tank. Um, he was actually, um, uh, he was the one, we had a guy who was just, just so happened to be holding a camera. His job was kind of to record, you know, human rights atrocities and things like that. So he was always running around with a camera and I don't even, I don't honestly don't even know why he was behind the tank with us. He didn't really serve any purpose. <laughs> so what did he do? Um, he, for whatever did, reason, he volunteered to go. And he, and he was the one that posted the video? No. So what happened was, um, after the rescue, uh, several days later, there was actually a, um, uh, a CNN film crew was in the, was in the, was in the city filming what was going on. And our, uh, our team leader gave them the footage of, of the rescue. And, um, they ended up playing it on, on CNN and, um, and then ended up going on Fox and ABC and every, everywhere. I ended up just going freaking everywhere and then all over the internet and just millions and millions and millions of views. Um, of the whole of the whole shebang but we didn't know that it had gone viral for for um for several weeks so i got back um so i was you know my my time was up um there on the mission but what was interesting was you know what we finished the mission and i was actually taken to a a bombed out mosque which was the Mm. aid station at the time inside mosul 
I was taken there and worked on by some um, Iraqi army medics and then driven back to um, Erbil in northern Iraq. Uh, and it's, is like, that, it's a safer area. And, that, and this is what led you to write the book after you came back? That's when I, that's when I started writing the book. I'd already made the decision to write the book weeks mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, so the rescue actually had nothing, uh, contrary to popular beliefs, the rescue had, ab had absolutely nothing to do with my decision to write the book. I had already intended on doing it um, a month earlier. Um, but yeah, so I, I got back to um, a nor the city of northern Iraq, and I spent a night in a, um, a Rocky or in a Kurdish um, hospital in a ward with a bunch of other guys who'd been shot in Mosul, um, all Kurdish. Not, you know, there were no other... Uh, <laughs> No other Westerners. And actually, in the middle of the night, the Kurdish intelligence, they sent an operative to come in because they heard that there was some white guy with a beard <laughs> in right. this, you know, in this ward who had been shot around Mosul. And the only white guys with beards um, that weren't American military in the area were ISIS fighters. Mm -hmm. And so they, they were coming to check me out and see, like, hey, what's up with this guy? Is he an ISIS? And mm. so they like interrogated me. It was it was fine. They just asked me a bunch of different questions. There's literally um, in the middle of the night. That is literally the uh, the craziest, uh, most insane. I mean, it just totally like, well, as much as one person can be there while you're listening to someone tell the story, and I, I I'm sure it's a very. It, I mean, it was more than traumatic for you. I can't even have empathy to understand how you felt at the time. And I appreciate you sharing that story. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if it was hard for you. If it was, I, you know, I appreciate your willingness to, to tell it and to share your experience because I think it's going to be meaningful for people to understand what someone like yourself would go through or did go through during that kind of experience and what the soldiers um, in, fr from our country or humanitarian fighters went through you know, on behalf of the innocent people around the world so we could have the freedom that we have here now. And I just really want to yeah. thank you for for sharing that story. It really means a lot to me. Thank you. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to tell it. Yeah. What are you, it's, um, it's what are you, uh, cathartic what, for me. Yeah, no, it's, it's, Hey man, talking is better than drinking, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's so, so true. <laughs> what are, what are you, um, what are you doing with yourself? What are you doing with yourself these days now, now that you're back yeah. into the, uh, around the, um, I don't know. Where do you, where do you live now? You said Wisconsin. Uh, yeah, so I'm actually I'm in the process of moving out to uh, to San Diego, but right now I'm in uh, Wisconsin visiting family for the holidays. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so right now, um, I, so I, I got back from Iraq. I wrote a book. I wrote the book City of Death with uh, mm -hmm. City of Death Humanitarian Warriors in the Battle of Mosul with Scott McEwen, who wrote mm -hmm. American Sniper. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually, right now, I run my own uh, humanitarian organization called Stronghold Rescue and Relief. And what we do is we have um, we take former uh, former military guys. And we go into conflict areas, and uh, our mission is a little bit different. We well, our, what we do is we go in and we teach them basically how to defend themselves. So finally, you know, years after having visited Thailand and looking at Burma and saying like, "Man, I wish I could go do something," mm -hmm. now, now I am. Um, and we have a full-time uh, rescue team of former military guys who are, who live there in Burma. They're local uh, ethnic uh, Burmese guys, and uh, from one of the local tribes. And they are full time. We, we, we've trained them on how to respond when the government attacks the people. We respond them on how to defend and evacuate and move the people out of there. And then we also provide, um, you know, a, a sort of immediate um, needs and food and shelter and things like that for the people. Mm -hmm. But just for a few days until the larger organizations can get in there and mm -hmm. kind of do who, um, who, who kind of long term care for the people. Who hires you for that? <laughs> how do, how do you uh, nobody hires me. So it's. So Stronghold Rescue and Relief, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We mm -hmm. subsist completely off of the donations of, um, of people. It's, it's a tax-deductible donation. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, most people, uh, a lot, we're basically, we basically subsist off of a lot of different people who each give, you know, 5 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month kind of thing and help support you. Is there a website for people that will be listening to this if people want to find out more yeah. about this organization? Yeah, go to uh, strongholdrescue.org and mm. you can check me out there uh, or ch check out the organization there. And then I'm always I'm also posting stuff about it on my own personal social media as well. Yeah. Well, the way things are going on in the United States these days, we might need a service like this right here on our own. On our I own know. <laughs> on our own soil. <laughs> I might be calling you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the that's the funny thing. I'm always like, I'm like maybe I'm just getting prepared for when we, when we all implode over here. <laughs> are you? Uh, do you ever uh, do you ever come it's to New York? Do you ever come to New York at all? 
Um, I, I don't usually spend a lot of time on the East Coast. I'm more of a West Coast and Midwest kind of guy. Um, well, it, but listen. yeah, I, 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 I have been out there and it's a cool spot. Manhattan's pretty cool. Well, there's a couple things I can do for you if you do come. Number one, there's always a bed for you here if you ever want to stay in New York. My wife and I would love to, ha- love to have you. And, um, be awesome. and I could take you up on a helicopter ride around the city anytime you want. I'll fly you myself. Oh man, we seriously need to we seriously need to do that because yeah, like uh, b- before we were talking, like I I get motion sick in airplanes and stuff really bad. I puked in the back of planes and boats, which is crazy. I know because I was a seal, um, but I always get seasick and air sick. Um, but I never got sick in helicopters, so yeah, I would love to. I'd love to go up in a helicopter. All right. Man. Well, you told me your story tonight, and see how I, that goes. I owe you a helicopter ride. All right. Oh man, that sounds awesome. All right. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you being well, thanks here. Thanks so much, Jeff, man. You're an awesome Thank dude. Thank you, man. This was fun. All right. I'll talk to you thanks. soon. I'll be in touch, okay? All right. Good night. All thanks. right. Sounds good. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.